over our many months of great isolation. It's been a long time since I gave a talk to a big room. So uh, you'll forgive me for fiddling with the technology and generally getting ready to do this, not staring down my webcam. So this is a really important moment for us to think about digital geographies and hope. Not very long ago, in the pandemic, it's vastly unequal impacts during protests against racial state violence in many places. We also saw a surge of creative digital interventions challenging structural violence. Communities repurposed productivity platforms and social media in support of mutual aid. Protesters were disrupting local governments, citizen surveillance technologies, and fighting for moratoria on evictions and criminalization measures that disproportionately affect impoverished people. More recently, though, we're hearing media and scholarly lament about the resurgence of urban removals, rollback of eviction protections and decriminalization efforts, and digital mutual aid innovations being abandoned or monetized as startups. Nope, wrong direction. This is a familiar cycle in critical social science analyses of digital technologies, from hope to despair, from rupture to reincorporation, from insurgency to pacification. These contours are familiar to us from analyses of the rise of GIS in participatory governance, the internet and anti-globalization protests, social media platforms and locative apps in the Arab Spring and Occupy movements. So today I want to spend time, our time together sketching out some off-ramps from the hope and despair interchange, a methodology of hope for digital geographies. I'll point to some work on digital urbanism that I think is leading us in this direction, and I'll do a deeper dive into an illustrative case to demonstrate the kinds of insights that might flow from methodologies of hope. But first, how did we get here? What is it that conditions so much of our analysis toward a foreclosure of hope? A great deal of critical digital geography scholarship is theoretically anchored in critiques of capitalist political economies. Drawing on Marx, Frankfurt School scholars, and others, a lot of this work sets up a hope and fear dialectic. It positions technology and political economy as co-determining structures that are continually reinforcing one another in sort of, and, and also continually recentering capitalist relations. Even in critique, you know, we are still centering that, uh, that co-determination. Another conceptual hearth has been Foucauldian notions of power knowledge as an enabling structure for governance, biopolitics, governmentality, and so on. Add in the neoliberalization of urban governance, its individualizing and economistic logics, and we've got a really powerful theoretical frame that anticipates the reproduction of dominance and dispossession. These tendencies are also steeped in what I see as wider reaching ambivalence in a lot of critical geography around hope, hopeful politics, and the possibilities for ending systemic inequality and endemic social suffering. Hopeful analyses of minor politics that meet everyday needs while fighting for systemic change are too often met with concerns that these efforts deflect from or defer broader structural transformation. Work on hope as an affective relation that can mobilize collective politics is shadowed by concerns about false hope or cruel optimism. Hope as something that coerces consent to an unequal status quo. Hopeful analyses of counterpolitics through embodied performative or artistic tactics are often met with a set of familiar skeptical questions. Can we trace definitive connections to structural change? Does it scale up? 
does it endure across time and extend across place? These are the questions that define a sort of hermeneutics of suspicion in digital geographies. And I would argue, tend to prefigure a range of hopeful politics to be found insufficient. It's an impasse that I think invites us toward an intentional turn to methodologies of hope. When I say methodologies of hope, many of you are recognizing Jose Esteban Munoz. In the so-called reparative turn in queer feminist theory, Munoz was confronting anti-relationality and queer negativity, arguing that these stances are only conceivable from within white masculine homonormativities. His work refuses to read queer life as tethered to domination and resistance, to structures of racial capitalism, or to hetero and cis normativities. In short, Munoz charts an off-ramp from theorizations that follow domination and resistance cycles and recenter normative terms of existence. Munoz's methodology of hope has been described as the relentless pursuit of the micro details of possibility. And I see a lot of that in the program over the next couple of days. He directs our analytic attention toward aesthetics that refuse to conform to straight normativities of many kind and invites us to read these performances for a surplus of affect and meaning that illustrate the not yet here. In this surplus of the here and now, Munoz tells us, we find forward dawning possibility. Importantly, this framing of surplus is an affirmative one. It's an ontological claim about the plenitude of everyday life worlds as a reservoir for creativity and possibility. This is not the surplus that drives capitalist systems of racial economic value. Also important is Munoz's emphasis on forward dawning possibility as generative. He reads for hope as practices of queer futurity, modes of thought and action that transgress normative scripts for being and do so in relation. Collective transgressions of normativities, he argues, are present practices that prefigure scripts for being and do so in relation. He writes that queer aesthetics map future social relations through rejection of a here and now and an insistence on potentiality or concrete possibility for another world. And in that, you're gonna, you hear the echoing of Ernst Bloch, who Karina was mentioning in her introduction. So Munoz situates these moves in queer life and queer feminist theory. But really similar impulses arise in black and Latinx radical traditions, abolition geographies, anti-racist and decolonial pedagogies, even some Christian liberation theologies. Importantly, none of these traditions of theory and life are making abstract claims about hope, nor are they engaged in naive optimism. All are explicit about lived experiences of race and gender violence and systemic harm to people who exist outside the categories of liberal inclusion, property, citizen, whiteness, and so on. In all these traditions, we find an insistence that concrete practices of collectivity and mutual support are already in formation all around us. For us in digital geographies, a methodology of hope could start from an epistemological turn toward plenitude. We have a great deal to learn from orienting our analytic attentions toward a generative excess of socio-spatial relations and imaginaries, and from interrogating how they set up, how they constitute a reservoir of possibilities for other futures. 
there are seeds to this way of thinking sprouting all around us. As examples, Shannon Mattern and Sarah Barnes, respectively, take an abundance-oriented stance to the digital city, arguing that the forms and relations of digital urbanism exceed the limits of platforms and their modes of abstraction, datification, and computation. Philippe Magelheis argues that the densities of people, materialities, and relations on which platform capitalism depends are also a vital reservoir that popular economy workers use to advance counterformations of urban life that refuse property and precarity, domination, and dispossession. People like Ruha Benjamin, Agnieszka Lezinski, Kavita Datani, Iona Datta, and others in various ways trace the incompleteness of techno-capitalist remakings of urban life and they show us how people craft tactics for living well with and around the glitchiness of digital mediation. Other scholars point us toward alternative futures that are being assembled through digital practice. Santala and McGurk theorize free cycling, green waste exchange, and other local sharing initiatives as practices that prefigure cities assembled around interdependent social relations and small-scale practices of mutual support. They frame these practices as highly adaptive socio-spatial performances within and beyond digital platforms. Here we see how reading urban socio-spatial relations as containing a generative surplus of creative possibilities is tightly bound, connected, to prefiguration of alternative futures. Similar arguments resonate in the work of people like Ruha Benjamin or Brian Jordan Jefferson writing about digitality and intersectional movements for black life. Other colleagues emphasize the aesthetic and the visual as vital terrains in which digital placemaking and urban futures get negotiated. Here I'm thinking of the work, of work by Lezinski and Kong, Deegan and Rose, Dotta and Odendahl, in various ways showing us the co-constitution of digital imagery and urban materialities. They show us how urban aesthetics condition bodily sensations and affective responses shaped by visual regimes that delimit what is perceptible and how it is seen and experienced. This work teaches us how mediated and mediatized urban aesthetics are implicated in the production of socio-spatial difference. So the ever-present rows of serialized, of platform-mediated bikes foster desire for seamless mobility and orderly spaces of elite consumption. The serialization of that aesthetic across place tends to condition what expectations about what gentrification and its constitutive other, urban decline, look like. These aesthetics are deeply effective, cueing preferences and actions through desire, fear, disgust, and so on. The mediatization of these aesthetic signatures is also significant because it regularizes the gaze from social media to the citizens to the city, often in order to legitimize structural and state power or to naturalize systemic inequalities. So for instance, Brandy Summers has argued that an aesthetics of blackness as cool or edgy has been appropriated into gentrification-based urban development in the US. This aesthetic move is materially consequential, she traces. It protects property and commercialization while dislocating black residents and communities. All of this work gives us some really vital insights into digital urbanism. But for the most part, analyses of aesthetics and visuality 
have largely centered on their role in city making by and for the powerful as part of the toolkit of techno-capitalist platformization. Ah, I'm one set behind, Brandy Summers. So uh, in that context, I would argue that a dimension, one dimension of a methodology of hope in digital geographies might involve orienting our attention toward what Summers has called insurgent aesthetics. She developed the concept in an analysis of graffiti art on businesses that were boarded up during COVID closures and during racial violence protests in Oakland, California. These artworks were unauthorized and illegal. They were created on temporary facades on private businesses and for the most part were swiftly removed. They're precisely the kind of politics and material presences that a hermeneutics of suspicion would prompt us to question as episodic and ephemeral. But if we read these material and visual politics as insurgent aesthetics, in doing that, Summers opens up what they do rather than redirecting us to what they don't do and might never do. She tells us that the sighting and visual form of these artworks functions as an aesthetic reoccupation that confronts decades of racialized removal in Oakland. She traces how the artworks pick up aesthetic scripts from long histories of Black and Latinx liberation struggle and produce urban texts that publicly critique privatization, policing, and impoverishment. In cities made by and for platform capital, Summers argues, these insurgent aesthetics interrupt regimes of order and uniformity that aim to make these cityscapes profitable through elite consumption. Insurgent aesthetic occupations, she argues, are vital reservoirs of transformation and potentiality. They consolidate enduring subaltern presences and open public imaginaries to radical politics. So for the rest of the time I have today, I wanna to bring this framework to some insurgent aesthetics that are more directly entangled in the digital mediation of urban life. I'm gonna build an analysis of a network of local groups in the US doing digital, visual, and away from keys activism mobilized around the phrase, stop the sweeps. This is, if you queue up Google images, uh, this is the kind of visual signature that it will retrieve if you search on stop the sweeps. So these are groups that confront municipal evictions of unsheltered people living in tent encampments in cities across the US. These removals often happen with no advance notice and no acceptable alternate housing or services. Tent encampments exist at the crossroads of legal, structural, and ideological forces that would seem to make their removal inevitable. Yet they and their allies are engaged in insurgent, uncooperative visual digital practices that advance a politics of staying put and prefigure radically different urban futures. Even as these groups are small, self-organized, and sometimes short-lived. These are the kinds of transformations, transformative digital mediations, that a methodology of hope stands to illuminate and to take seriously. Some context. In the US, urban development has long relied on dispossession to literally make space for capital, property, and property persons. These dynamics have only intensified with the rise of platforms and algorithmic governance. Long-standing ideologies around impoverishment make the removal of precarious people seem rational, necessary, and for many people, non-controversial. This normative common sense is conditioned by a liberal visual regime that stigmatizes, criminalizes, and thoroughly dehumanizes unsheltered people. 
pervasive imagery in media, policy debates, and popular culture depicts unsheltered people as lazy, dirty, dangerous, damaged. Material objects like trash and tents, worn out clothing, old or broken belongings tend to stand in for people, visual substitutions that signify them as cast off, as disregarded. They're framed as thoroughly out of place, which I'm sure you saw in the preceding set of images. Sitting and lying on sidewalks, eating, washing up, sleeping, private things in public places. The affective register associated with these visual signatures is intense. It cues aversion, fear, anger, sometimes a very narrowly conceived sympathy. These are scripts that authorize surveillance, coercive forms of care and removal, removals that include the systematic eviction of tent encampments by municipal governments. These evictions, commonly referred to as sweeps, are a codified, supposedly data-driven practice of liberal state violence. Sweeps policies rely on municipal land use, housing, and public health code. They set out detailed spatial and temporal conditions of removability, creating an obstruction, located in harm's way, present outside the designated hours, and so on. Municipal reporting apps like Seattle's Find It, Fix It are thoroughly entangled in sweeps. They're heavily used by businesses and housed residents to report encampments and their locations, which effectively datafies them as a prelude to removal. But sweeps are hotly contested by encampment residents and their allies, in part through Stop the Sweeps. This form of activism is present all across the US, but it's a self-organized network. It's not institutionalized, coordinated, not sort of imbricated in the kind of nonprofit industrial complex. It's constituted rather through shared invocation of Stop the Sweeps as an organizing frame for a set of actions that are remarkably similar across place. So Stop the Sweeps groups organize protests, they mobilize mutual aid to encampment dwellers, and offer assistance to residents during an eviction. They're engaged in popular education across the shelter crisis and what they see as its structural causes, property, policing, regressive taxation, worker and tenant abuse, inadequate public health protections, and much more. So these are politics that come together under the auspices of encampment evictions, but really they're systematically indicting the entire liberal state apparatus that is set up to protect property and property people. These actions and politics are digitally mediated and they are mediatized. Online and in the social media verse, stop the sweeps is a search term and a hashtag that interconnects dispersed local actions. Stop the Sweeps coalitions follow one another, repost one another's content, and link their followers onto relevant threads. Their digital and their away from keys actions make use of a complex ecosystem of apps and platforms. Instagram, X, Facebook, YouTube, and Linktree, messaging and payment apps, Google Docs, and other productivity platforms. And their social media presence is intensely visual, as you're gonna see here in some representative content screenshotted from Instagram. Different places seem to have different go-to representational forms, even as the visual and material politics are remarkably similar from place to place. So Portland often follows zine-style graphic art, Eugene features memes and graffiti. Sacramento follows a cartoon and anime style. Seattle's go-to form is documentary photography. So now I want to do a deeper dive into the digital visual 
politics of Stop the Sweep Seattle. You'll largely, the visual portion of this, you'll largely see represented through their Instagram posts, though that they cross-publish that widely across a number of platforms. Following some of the conceptual framework, I want to orient to these politics as insurgent aesthetics that are also tightly linked to material interventions into the possibilities for being and thriving in the city. <coughs> I'm at an early stage in this project, but nonetheless, reading Stop the Sweeps as insurgent aesthetics illuminates some substantial ruptures in key elements of the normative regimes and socio-spatial and temporal imaginaries that are used to justify encampment removals. Stop the Sweeps, like its sibling organizations in other places, interrupts the widely held liberal common sense about the shelter crisis, its causes, and what should be done. Their visual digital politics and locally grounded actions prefigure urban futures assembled around emplacement, mutual support, and self-determination for unsheltered people. In the US, this is a distinctly radical politics around urban impoverishment. So Stop the Sweep Seattle disseminates a range of content and visual digital forms in its social media feeds. Their defining signature is a carefully choreographed weekly post that documents sweeps in Seattle and mobilizes action in response. So each week, you'll see a four to six slide post that typically includes documentary photos or videos of a sweep, a sweeps last week map by day, by neighborhood, denoting unannounced sweeps. Those are the surprise markers. A sweeps this week infographic, including how to get there, how to join them. You can also support us by donating. This consistent visual logic cues viewer attention through its repetition. The structure, representational forms, even the pastel color scheme is repeated, becoming a familiar cue amidst the visual clutter of a social media feed. Importantly, these visual politics refuse to reproduce the familiar scripting and problematization of homelessness through the figure of the unsheltered person. Encampment residents are very rarely pictured in any of their content. A core element of Seattle's visual tactic involves substitution. They take the socio-spatial problem frames typically aimed at unsheltered people and encampments and redirect them at various symbols of the apparatus of removal. So the shelter crisis is embodied not in the figure of the unsheltered person, but through the figures of police officers and municipal workers. It's materialized in the vehicles and heavy equipment used for removal. These images are powerfully formulaic, appearing over and over and over again, not just in the Seattle feed, but in many, many different places. The aesthetic signatures become familiar through repetition the blue and the black uniforms, the yellow and orange safety vests, the black and white municipal vehicles and contractors. These visual texts repeatedly substitute the embodied actions and behaviors of police and removal workers as the problem, with photos and videos that create a sense of disproportionality, domination, and disregard. We see seven police officers looming over a single resident who's packing to move, four of them creating a human barrier as a resident carries away a single box of belongings. Countless images depict police and municipal workers laughing and smiling while they watch distressed residents packing to leave their homes. These visual texts sometimes redirect the divisive scripts aimed at unsheltered people back onto these central figures of administrative violence. Police and contract workers are repeatedly framed as idle, chit-chatting, standing around, even playing basketball nearby. 
other visual substitutions redirect the supposed problem of obstruction. In Seattle, recall that obstruction of thoroughfares allows for immediate removal. Yet in countless posts, we see police, vehicles, police tape blocking roads, paths, and sidewalks during and even after an eviction. Cumulatively, these insurgent aesthetics interrupt powerful core elements of the prevailing visual regime that stigmatizes unsheltered people. They re-script the grounded problem frames that render certain bodies and presences as illegitimate. They call into question precisely whose presence and actions are legitimate. The affective terrain of these visual tactics is one of moral outrage and injustice. A thoroughgoing rupture of efforts to script encampment removal as nonviolent or even sometimes as a form of care to vulnerable people. Stop the Sweep Seattle's visual aesthetic repertoire also interrupts prevailing representations of the temporality of sweeps. In Seattle, a great deal of the official and mainstream media discourse frames encampment removals as episodic and unusual. Public discourse emphasizes the regularized timelines and procedures that govern removal, provisions for advance notice and alternative housing offers, systematic guidelines for storage and retrieval of belongings, and so on. The effect is a sort of sociotemporal framing of encampment removals as slow, orderly, and unfolding on a predictable timeline. The affective repertoire of all that is one of reason, rationality, even an absence of emotion. Stop the Sweep Seattle shatters those fictions through a range of representational and narrative tactics. Recall the Stop the Sweeps maps that are part of their routine weekly choreography. This ever-expanding map series creates a durable archive of removal that accretes week after week after week. Contra to framings of sweeps as unusual or episodic, this archive documents removals happening everywhere and all the time. In contrast to representations of sweeps as slow and orderly, Seattle's weekly posts emphasize speed, repetition, and chaos. Interpretive texts on photos emphasizes the limited time residents have to prepare and depart and the relentless pace of removals. Could you move out of your home in just a few hours? This site was swept three times in just one week. Photos capture a sense of the chaotic pace of removals and the resulting devastation. Heaps of belongings being destroyed or abandoned, land gouged, scraped bare. In contrast, staying put is framed as important and necessary. So one post emphasized at length a two-year-old encampment that was home to dozens of people and was widely known as a safe and stable place to move. These framings do more than simply recirculate counterfactual information. They're deploying temporality as a kind of counterpolitics that calls into question the sense of order, reason, and rationality that's advanced in mainstream representations of sweeps against portrayals of an orderly process that promises to revive and restore the city, Stop the Sweeps widely circulates visual texts that inframe chaos, disorder, and devastation. Here again, we see digitally mediated tactics that shatter the fiction of encampment removal as care or compassion. Importantly, these insurgent aesthetics of Stop the Sweeps are simultaneously, even as they're issuing these critiques that intervene in some of the really powerful closures of sort of common sense about urban life, at the same time, 
they're simultaneously demonstrating and circulating alternatives in Seattle and all across their network. So if we read these politics for prefiguration of urban futures, we illuminate the work that Stop the Sweeps is doing to mobilize some basic practices of an actually caring city. So nearly all Stop the Sweeps coalitions are engaged in some form of mutual aid that advances a vision for actually caring urban futures. They're organizing and documenting mutual aid to countless encampments, demonstrating ways of supporting residents without evicting them. They use multiple platforms to mobilize and coordinate people and supplies to provide the things that residents say they need to live as safely and comfortably as possible where they are. Clothing, phone chargers, food and water, books to read, sunscreen, cooking equipment, first aid kits, any number of things. Framings of this mutual aid work emphasize meeting residents' self-articulated needs, not hassling them into the self-improvement regime that defines access to so much social service in the US. In the material and digital spaces they create, Stop the Sweeps groups are engaged in a prefigurative practice that creates cities organized around staying put, around interdependency, and around self-determination for all, not just for privileged people. These efforts to prefigure other urban futures in a violently unequal here and now are also advanced in the radical popular education that many Stop the Sweeps groups are doing through their social media networks. Much of the content produced and circulated is explicitly pedagogical. Some posts educate local residents to engage them as allies. For instance, teaching them how to discern the relevant details about upcoming sweeps from municipal postings so that Stop the Sweeps groups can mobilize, assist, and document those. Other posts unmask the supposed neutrality of administrative law, showing how local or state actions come to function in, in discriminatory ways. Some content teaches about interconnections between encampment removal and other forms of structural violence, incarceration, policing, tenant eviction, regressive taxation, and more. The enduring presence and thriving of radical pedagogies is especially significant in a moment of really intense state repression of liberation-oriented pedagogies all over the US right now. There are several ways that mediatization matters for these insurgent aesthetics and prefigurative practices. Through a dense, multi-platform presence in the social mediaverse, Stop the Sweeps coalitions create a durable, expanding, and broadly accessible public archive of sweeps across the nation. Their visual digital strategies intervene in pervasive erasure of unsheltered people and concealment of an organized abandonment by the state. They make permanent and visible what city officials, corporate investors, and other power brokers aim to make invisible and removable. Mediatization plays a role in rendering these counter narratives and coalitional presence broadly extensible and accessible across places and issues. Cross postings of local campaigns or events, calls to action, and popular education content by Stop the Sweeps groups reveals their participation in dense local solidarity networks supporting each other's activism around depolicing, public transit justice, worker and tenant abuse, and more. You see here one example of the kind of dense networks across issues. This is a grab from uh, the Portland network. Mediatization has enabled the proliferation of Stop the Sweeps as a frame in the absence of an organized campaign. 
the consistency in Stop the Sweeps Group's visual and digital tactics and their grounded actions suggests that mediatization of these insurgent politics may be enabling mutual learning and interchange across this self-organized network. In all this, we see Stop the Sweeps assembling a multi-sided social and digital infrastructure for mobilization, politicization, popular education, and collective care. Their work is intensive and extensive. They defy the deeply dehumanizing ideologies and actions that are common and largely unremarkable to many in the US. All that is profoundly hopeful. So circling back to methodologies of hope as an orientation toward digital geographies, what does this allow us to see? How does it help us exit hope and despair cycles? Hope as an analytic orients us toward small-scale engines of intense social and political creativity and solidarity making. It tries to apprehend them on their own terms and take seriously the capillary relations that connect micropolitics to structural transformations. The mobilizations that I've been talking about are minimally resourced. Some are ephemeral, many are small. Yet a close reading of their visual digital praxis illuminates a depth, breadth, and complexity of social, spatial, and digital interventions into lived worlds. It's an approach that stands to reveal radical claims to the urban present and future that elude pacification and depoliticization. Finally, a methodology of hope stands to reveal the existence of digital geographies that exceed our socio-spatial imaginaries. This is crucial. Tracing the national footprint of Stop the Sweeps coalitions through its connections in the social media verse revealed spatial patterns that thoroughly confounded my own imagination of where in the US radical and regressive politics are likely to be found. Red state, blue state, Left coast, heartland, sunbelt, Bible belt, rural, urban, suburban. Stop the sweeps is present in all of those kinds of places. In the ever present din of concerns about digital mediation and political polarization, there's something profoundly hopeful about the existence of radical politics whose digital spatial signatures overspill these supposed echo chambers. This is just one set of examples of the kinds of openings that might arise in an intentional turn to methodologies of hope. What it looks like in the places, digitalities, and issues that all of you study is bound to be different. We're gonna, wonderfully, we're gonna see some of that unfolded in the next several days. But I think we have a lot to gain in orienting to digital geographies through hopeful analytics. And I'm looking forward to seeing more of that. Thanks very much. I think I meant to invite your questions. I think one of our colleagues is going to uh, run around with a wireless microphone so that you will be visible in the recording. And of course, I will remind you that when we're finished, your coffee is that way. Thank you very much, Sarah, uh, for this interesting, also very grounded uh, presentation. I, I'm sure that there will be uh, many questions. So, yeah, just one person. Hello. trying to battle between hope and hopelessness and my responsibility as a researcher and thinking that if I try to foster the kind of agency that believes that alternative futures, imaginaries of alternative futures matter and then kind of in a sense 
responsibilizes the individual when actually we are kind of having these huge structural, infrastructural, technological, unconscious powers when we talk about the digital everyday life, no matter how much I would like to go for the alternative, sustainable, ethical platforms, services, devices, those alternatives don't really exist in a way that they would produce the smoothness in my everyday life that I want from my digital setting. So my cry for help is somehow to try to understand how to negotiate this. If I give up hope and say that there's very little we can do in the face of all this, so then there's not much left. But if I go for the hope, am I a bit delusional, thinking that at the micro level it matters like you so it's inspirationally presented here that the micro level matters a lot. And I believe it does. I really want to believe it does. But this is my, my conflict. And I have myself tried to go for the kind of idea of a guerrilla intellectual following Walter Rodney, thinking what it would mean in academia for me as an activist, as a person, and how we would reimagine everything. The academia, how we do research, what paradigms we have, what methods we do. So I would like to hear some thoughts on the hope and the hopelessness. I think you, you've you traced out uh, sort of the intention dynamics that we navigate in this kind of work. Uh, you're, this is not the question that you have posed, but so often when I give a set of remarks like this, uh, the next question is, yes, but what about the sort of structural the powerful structural relations that delimit foreclose the range of options, um, possibilities for doing otherwise, uh, speaking about, uh, say, in the digital world, that opting out is something that is only available to more privileged social groups. Um, it's familiar dynamics. And a, I'm not familiar with the work on guerrilla intellectualism, but uh, like the sort of dis the unruly impulse that I think it encompasses, uh, I guess the for the worries about individualism, I think uh, questions of collectivity and solidarity in the realm of micropolitics are perhaps. Uh, something very important because they push against uh, that, uh, the individualizing dimension, uh, in particular in our relation to um, sort of digital practice in everyday life. Uh, I'm not there yet with this set of empirics, but I'm really interested in who are the individuals uh, and sort of groups of individuals behind these particular place based media feeds, because it could be any range of possibilities that I think stand to teach us something about the complexity of these kinds of digital politics. Um, you know, and I guess to the struggle of it in the work that we do as thinkers and activists, I guess I always say, thank heavens we have our whole lives to become ourselves. It's never just a single set of empirics or a single project. And in that, you know, many of these impulses have circulated really differently for me at other points in sort of my own trajectory as a thinker. Um, and there will always be plenty of critique out there. You know, so I always tell myself I don't have to do it all in any given uh, project or moment. Visual as well, like I usually do. Um, a 
just have a brief comment to you before I have a question. Um, just before I came here, I was finalizing this article that I'm writing with uh, my colleague here, uh, Derek Ruth, who's been studying the compassionate city and the critique towards that. And uh, Louisville, that's sort of like a pioneer in the city of this compassionate city um, uh, stuff. Um, I was just checking when you were talking that, that uh, there is no group of the uh, Stop the Sweeps in Louisville, but there are people who are connected to it to the network, to um, oppose the compassionate city stuff that the city is doing not very compassionately. And, and the issue of homelessness, of course, is a really big issue in that area as well. So just a comment. But I would be interested in um, the, the pedagogical aspects that you brought up. Um, do the people involved in the, in the Stop the Swift network, um, do they explicitly talk about their activities as pedagogical, or you were using uh, the concepts of radical pedagogy or uh, mutual learning or popular education. Do they use those in the activities or is that more your reading of what they're doing? I think the specific language of pedagogies is mine. Uh, I do see, although I'm not going to be able to sort of pull from memory a tight specific place-based example, um, popular education does arise and there's some, um, you know, primarily uh, rooted in Paulo Freire and see some sort of explicit scooping up of that. Um, so popular education and then uh, the sort of activist um, frame for the in-person sort of mutual learning that they do seems to be the frame of the workshop uh, that seems to encapsulate uh, some of the sort of teaching and learning work that they're doing with frequently uh, with and through other groups in the local area. Oh, thanks. That's, that's really interesting. Thank you. Hi. Thank you so much for this very enlightening speech. I actually had a question uh, regarding the visuality. I found it very interesting when you talked about the and then this kind of counter visualities uh, um, has has it had had an effect in the circulation of kind of media imagery? Has mainstream press or other kind of more popular uh, institutions or, or whatnot uh, taken these imageries uh, and start to counter, or is it still marginal and kind of in? I don't know. Um, Certainly, I haven't drilled down into sort of the proliferation of some of this imagery. Um, certainly, in Seattle, the local street paper recirculates. It's called Real Change News. Uh, they recirculate some of the shared maps, uh, infographics, some of the same data, but we would expect them to. You know, there's going to be strong relationships between that alternative journalism and, you know, they're doing some of the same work. Check back with me in six months. Okay, thank you, Sarah, for this wonderful talk. Um, I have a, a question concerning the, the, in the very end of your talk, you, you talked about the kind of um, durable, uh, that, that this works as a kind of durable public archive, digital archive, and uh, um, and also about the the way this um, has been able to overspill the, the echo chambers, and I think those both um, aspects are quite interesting because. Um, a lot of uh, social movements and different kinds of uh, campaigns and groups, I think they quite a lot of struggle with the, with the digital in terms of sustainability. Things are very ephemeral and changing constantly. And, and there is a lot of maintenance problems. And then on the other hand, they, they often get stuck in, in certain echo chambers and can't actually reach wider. So do you have any view how this this is possible, and, and what, what might be the kind of characteristics that enable these aspects to emerge? Moving forward, 
one of the things that I'm interested to begin to ask of the individuals that are creating so much of the visual trace uh, that's so present to us is this question of sustainability. Um, think putting it in the con so haven't asked the folks that are doing it, don't know, you know, is this a set of skills that a sort of core organizing collective has? Is it being drilled out to a single person? I suspect that the different visual signatures are sort of the result of what a, a what's the base set of skills or visual expertise uh, that folks doing it have. Um, you know, and so that leads me to think that you've probably on the visual element at least got one person who is doing that potentially. Uh, I think that the digital, the digital ecosystem is a little bit different for each. Um, and I think that that too is probably going from the activist tradition of we make what we have with who we have, um, of assembling a set of practices that kind of are collaged, quilted, patchworked together through a group of people on the basis of the skills and access that they have. So uh, I suspect that some of the visual imagery that we're seeing, the infographics, uh, is folks who may have access to some kinds of editing software at work. You know, we see a lot of that kind of crossover between one's activist world and the um, sort of professionalized worlds. And probably I think that there, even as I sort of understand and sympathize with the sort of caution, the asterisk on sort of engagement with the productivity platforms, with sort of the suite of supposedly free technologies that techno-capitalism gives us. I think our colleagues in Stop the Sweeps are all would share those critiques and might also say that part of what makes this aspect of their work sustainable is being able to do a broad and kind of lightweight engagement with those technologies. Like I think the one of the things I saw with GIS and some of the mapping technologies in prior work was it was one piece of a really broad set of digital spatial practices that didn't need to have the kind of expertise in GIS that, um, you know, a geographer deeply schooled in this might have, but just enough, it's the creative assembly and the complexity that I think brings us the sustainability and also the creative potential. You know, my activist colleagues in Chicago could think about GIS in ways that were just completely outside of the way that I have been schooled to think about them in geography. Thanks, thanks for a great talk. Um, you mentioned that uh, Stop, Stop, Stop the Sweeps has sort of disseminated across the US to different places that you didn't expect to find it. Um, and I began to uh, think that it probably is quite important for the movement and those who are involved that it is locally embedded and locally based uh, activism. But then again, it's, it's, um, you could find it in, in different parts of the US. Um, how would you see, is it important nevertheless uh, that it, is, it can be found in different places, that it's sort of it's, it's elsewhere as well. How, how important motivation is that for, for, uh, for people involved? And um, sort of in terms of scale, sort of structuration of the of political activism, mm -hmm. how, how, how do the, these two the fails play together if they do? And do you see possibilities, or, or are you aware of, of this being sort of, if it's translocal? national as well because homelessness surely is is, uh, is present everywhere. So are there, are there any signs of this, this sort of activism being elsewhere than in, in the US? So I'll work backward. Uh, 
does anyone, I don't know if the frame Stop the Sweeps extends beyond the US. Um, certainly, I guess I do have one illustration as a frame it extends into at least one Canadian city, Vancouver. But I would, ex that is not surprising uh, because the sort of activist networks and sort of local government practices uh, of Seattle and Vancouver tend to hop the border in ways that mirror one another. So there's a lot of, uh, Vancouver usually leads on progressive policy, Seattle on regressive policy, and then they learn from one another. Um, does anybody else know of any sort of stop the sweeps presence outside of North America? Don't worry, I won't ask, I won't pick on you and ask you to talk about it. Um, I think the sort of systematic municipal eviction could well, certainly there are divisive sort of formally organized removals of unsheltered people happening in cities all over the world. Sweeps as a particular sort of publicly codified kind of a thing could be a US thing. Um, given the kind of long history of municipal legislation against unsheltered people. So I, I wouldn't be totally surprised if sweeps per se and the sort of counter movement of it is US based. I do completely agree with your sort of framing that the local embeddedness uh, but the translocal circulation of some of the politics uh, and visual imaginaries is important. Um, in, and sort of how does it matter that uh, Stop the Sweeps is found in a small sort of semi-rural place like Watsonville, California? Um, I think part of what that does is sort of rupture some of the counter politics that are assembled around regional imaginaries. You know, at first, entering from Seattle, and the case of Seattle, my first thought was, well, it's easy to uh, dismiss what I'm seeing in Seattle as well. It's just left coast, you know, blue state liberal Seattle. Um, but for instance, uh, there's some really interesting work coming out of Kalamazoo, Michigan, which, you know, Michigan has been a strikingly conservative place for a very long time. But part of what is important, I think, in this frame and set of actions popping up in a place like Kalamazoo is it prompts us to ask some questions about enduring radical politics that pull on other times and places. Um, I suspect that I haven't traced it, but I would venture to guess that the people and politics uh, associated with this work in Kalamazoo are probably deeply inscribed in the really long-standing racial justice activism that's rooted in Detroit. So they probably, uh, in addition to sort of picking up on kind of the translo national, translocal dynamics of all this, it probably has a particular flavor of um, some of those radical histories. The sort of deeply fractured nature of um, 
administrative law in the US means that there is no sort of national level policy uh, and indeed very little state level policy. That's partly why municipal regulation looms so large. Um, in terms of the legal structure, most uh, national law, national civil rights law in the US is structured around um, the precedent of being able to track intention to discriminate. And so what we've seen over the last 30 years or so is a shift to what Chandan Reddy calls administrative law, which can claim to be racially or economically neutral even as it's working in functionally discriminatory ways and it's completely slippery to any of the sort of federal discrimination law. So um, I think uh, the kind of dislocation that you describe in the case of India, um, certainly we see that, although usually it's simply expelling without any um, sort of alternative resources uh, through things like uh, Seattle had banishment, essentially banishment orders, where if you'd been arrested and cited for particular sorts of things, there literally was a designated area of the downtown that you, an individual simply could not enter. Um, or through sort of the idiosyncratic practices of the 90s of local police uh, and other municipal workers uh, just getting one-way public transit tickets and putting people on the bus. I agree. There's so many important questions to ask around sort of the nature of the platform, its provenance, the sort of arenas of life in which it's um, appearing. It's really interesting to imagine. Um, it sounds like you're describing a sort of platformization that is enabling access to sort of self-determined basic employment, um, as well as sort of the social functioning of the city. Uh, I'm sure that it's struggling, that uh, the groups doing that are probably struggling around questions of access to data, concerns about worker surveillance, who can sort of access that information. Um, 
you know, that's one of the reasons why I'm so excited for us to think with one another around, because I think that there's similar sorts of questions and innovations happening locally all over the world. Um, you know, I think about the way that uh, Seattle's street paper, Real Change News, struggled with uh, the declining use of cash. You know, their vendors who are selling the alternative newspaper on the street for, you know, very successfully for 30 years uh, have been greatly challenged by the dwindling number of people who uh, on the street have $2 in cash to buy the paper, but yet uh, cash is a politics for their organization and their vendors because it'll, it is, um, it allows self-determination. You know, you can use that cash for whatever you need and want. Uh, they have nonetheless figured out some creative ways to uh, allow digital purchase that also, importantly, deal with some of the mainstream payment apps, but put that cost on the purchaser of the newspaper, not on their organization or the person selling it. Uh, you might also be interested in uh, the sort of coalition of day laborers in New York City um, called Jornalero that uh, cre with some local groups created a, day, a sort of counter surveillance app that, not really counter surveillance, but a sort of worker safety app that was allowing uh, workers to exchange information about um, good employers, uh, vehicles that they should, whose calls they should not respond to for non-payment or worker abuse. Um, I'm sure those are but two examples of the many that you all know about. Hello. Thank you very much for your presentation. And I would like to talk, ask you to comment a little bit more on this dynamic between platforms, infrastructures, would you consider these micro initiatives as kind of uh, attempt to at least to reconstitute how platforms function to re redirect the direction of public's attention to this problem and how to treat this problem through these visual images? Okay, let me be sh let me be sure I understand your question. Uh, you ask about these kinds of platforms as uh, efforts to sort of repurpose the platform, re-inhabit it around alternative imaginaries. I think at first blush, I would say politics like these uh, don't necessarily intervene in the platform mediation of everyday urban life as such. Uh, Digital mediation, the sort of mediatization of these platforms, uh, I think functions as a mechanism of reimagining and restructuring urban life, but doesn't necessarily try to transform the platforms themselves. And so many of the familiar dynamics of information extraction, problems of sort of what is possible within particular interfaces, the affordances of a partic one particular platform versus others, generally remain on sort of transformed. That said, I do think that this may be part of the reason why we see uh, sort of a thin but extensible digital engagement um, and also reliance on the really intensely visual platforms uh, because I think there's a kind of fluidity that can be tapped into there in some creative ways. Okay, uh, we are almost out of time. I just wonder if there is any final question. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. It's always the truth, the person um, who is organizing, it's always hardest for you to see. <laughs> Uh, I 
I was just wondering, you know, what is your thought about sites per se as cont contested spaces? Can we really call something a local anymore with the digital participation? So with, with the digital participation. So these kind of categorizations are not there anymore, and it's more like a plane of imminence. And we have so many other instances, so many protests, for example, the Yellow West protest in Paris, the Hong Kong protest, the Lebanon protest, there's so many protests, you know, which which started out as local, but then uh, you have people participating from different places, also uh, in the disinformation, disinformation spaces, where uh, you, know, you have uh, troll farms located in different countries uh, to tweet about uh, issues which are uh, happening somewhere else. So yeah, your thoughts about these sites, which are not really, uh, yeah, restricted anymore. This is why it's always so fun to give a brand new set of ideas to a big room of people, because what comes back at you is so interesting. Um, and mostly, you haven't thought about any of it before. Um, yeah, I think um, I'm thinking between your question and Uni's question about the um, sort of the locally grounded nature of practice and yours about the sort of almost untethered kind of circulability uh, that digitality allows. And I think this may be part of where our attention to the aesthetic, uh, sort of the representational, the affective dimensions of particular kinds of politics and claims is really important because in many cases, some of the ta specific tactics and forms are um, portable, for lack of a better word, and rendered portable because of digitality. Not necessarily in sort of identical ways, but almost in modular ways. Uh, many of you in the room will have a much deeper read in media studies than me, but thinking about the ways uh, that digitality itself is modif systematically modifiable, I think is relevant. But I also think that in the specific set of examples I'm talking about and some and many examples that are going to show up in your own work, uh, the simultaneity of that dimension, that bundle of dimensions, with sort of grounded local practice uh, and interventions into materially lived experiences may be relevant. So um, much of what we see in Stop the Sweeps is responding to a set of practices uh, that legislate through municipal regulation in a particular way or even respond to sort of the material geographies of the place, um, the kinds of the specific places where encampments are, the kinds of landscapes that they're in. Uh, I was noticing some sort of locally based differences both in what activists are doing in these places, what the people who are living in them need. It's really variable uh, from, say, arid Southern California to sort of deeply damp and boggy Western Oregon, for instance. Um, so like a good social scientist, I will say both and. <laughs> Thank you. Um, now our discussions will have to continue over coffee. Um, and also don't miss the opportunity to look at the exhibition if you exit through that door on that side. <laughs> so thank you again, Sarah. For <laughs>
Certainly in the U.S.